Chapter 6, The Adventures of Eustace. At that very moment, the others were washing hands and faces in the river and generally getting ready for dinner and a rest. The three best archers had gone up into the hills north of the bay and returned laden with a pair of wild goats, which were now roasting over a fire. Caspian had ordered a cask of wine ashore, strong wine of Arkenland, which had to be mixed with water before you drank it, so there would be plenty for all. The work had gone well so far, and it was a merry meal. Only after the second helping of goat did Edmund say, Where's that blighter Eustace? Meanwhile, Eustace stared round the unknown valley. It was so narrow and deep, and the precipices which surrounded it so sheer, that it was like a huge pit or trench. The floor was grassy, though strewn with rocks, and here and there Eustace saw black burnt patches, like those you see on the sides of a railway embankment in a dry summer. About 15 yards away from him was a pool of clear, smooth water. There was at first nothing else at all in the valley, not an animal, not a bird, not an insect. The sun beat down and grim peaks and horns of mountains peered over the valley's edge. Eustace realised, of course, that in the fog he had come down the wrong side of the ridge, so he turned at once to see about getting back. But as soon as he looked, he shuddered. Apparently he had, by amazing luck, found the only possible way down, a long green spit of land, horribly steep and narrow, with precipices on either side. There was no other possible way of getting back. But could he do it now that he saw what it was really like? His head swam at the very thought of it. He turned round again, thinking that at any rate, he better have a good drink from the pool first. But as soon as he turned, and before he'd taken a step forward into the valley, he heard a noise behind him. It was only a small noise, but it sounded loud in that immense silence. It froze him dead still where he stood for a second. Then he slewed round his head and looked. At the bottom of the cliff, a little on his left hand, was a low, dark hole, the entrance to a cave, perhaps. And out of this, two thin wisps of smoke were coming. And the loose stones just beneath the dark hollow were moving. That was the noise he had heard, just as if something were crawling in the dark behind them. Something was crawling. Worse still, something was coming out. Edmund or Lucy or you would have recognised it at once, but Eustace had read none of the right books. The thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long, lead-coloured snout. Dull red eyes. No feathers or fur. A long, lithe body that trailed on the ground. Legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's cruel claws, bats' wings that made a rasping noise on the stones, yards of tail, and the two lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would have it made things any better if he had. Perhaps, though, if he'd known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at this dragon's behaviour. It did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a stream of flame from its mouth. The smoke from its nostrils was like the smoke of a fire that will not last much longer. Nor did it seem to have noticed Eustace. It moved very slowly towards the pool, slowly and with many pauses. Even in his fear, Eustace felt that it was an old, sad creature. He wondered if he dared make a dash for the ascent, but it might look round if he made any noise. It might come more to life. Perhaps it was only shamming. Anyway, what was the use of trying to escape by climbing from a creature that could fly? It reached the pool and slid its horrible scaly chin down over the gravel to drink. But before it had drunk, there came from it a great croaking or clanging cry. And after a few twitches and convulsions, it rolled round on its side and lay perfectly still with one claw in the air. A little dark blood gushed from its wide open mouth. The smoke from its nostrils turned black for a moment, then floated away. No more came. For a long time, Eustace did not dare to move. Perhaps this was the brute's trick, the way it lured travellers to their doom. But one couldn't wait forever. He took a step nearer, then two steps and halted again. The dragon remained motionless. He noticed, too, that the red fire had gone out of its eyes. At last he came up to it. He was quite sure now that it was dead. With a shudder, he touched it. Nothing happened. The relief was so great that Eustace almost laughed out loud. 
He began to feel as if he'd fought and killed the dragon instead of merely seeing it die. He stepped over it and went to the pool for his drink, for the heat was getting unbearable. He was not surprised when he heard a peal of thunder. Almost immediately afterwards, the sun disappeared, and before he'd finished his drink, big drops of rain were falling. The climate of this island was a very unpleasant one. In less than a minute, Eustace was wet to the skin and half blinded with such rain as one never sees in Europe. There was no use trying to climb out of the valley as long as this lasted. He bolted for the only shelter in sight, the dragon's cave. There he lay down and tried to get his breath. Most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair. But as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That is why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns, and there seemed to be a great many round flat things, and it all clinked when he moved. There was light enough at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course Eustace found it to be what any of us would have, could have told him in advance. Treasure. There were crowns. Those were the prickly things. Coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates and gems. Eustace, unlike most boys, had never thought much of treasure, but he saw at once the use it would be in his new world, which he had so foolishly stumbled into through the picture in Lucy's bedroom at home. They don't have any tax, he said, and you don't have to give treasure to the government. With some of this stuff, I could have quite a decent time here, perhaps in Calumen. It sounds the least phony of these countries. I wonder how much I can carry. That bracelet's now. Those things in it are probably diamonds. I'll slip that on my own wrist. Too big, but not if I push it right up here above my elbow. Then I'll fill my pockets with diamonds. That's easier than gold. I wonder when this infernal rain's going to let up. He got into a less uncomfortable part of the pile, where it was mostly coins, and settled down to wait. But a bad fright, when once it is over, and especially a bad fright following a mountain walk, leaves you very tired. Eustace fell asleep. By the time he was sound asleep and snoring, the others had finished dinner and become seriously alarmed about him. They shouted, Eustace! Eustace! Cooey! Till they were hoarse and Caspian blew his horn. He's nowhere near or he'd have heard that, said Lucy with a white face. Confound the fellow, said Edmund. What on earth did he want to stink away like that for? But we must do something, said Lucy. He might have got lost or fallen into a hole or been captured by savages or killed by wild beasts, said Drinian. And a good riddance if he has, I say, muttered Rince. Master Rince, said Reaper you never spoke a word that became you less. The creature is no friend of mine, but he is of the Queen's blood, and while he's one of our fellowship, it concerns our honour to find him and to avenge him if he is dead. Of course we've got to find him if we can, said Caspian wearily. That's the nuisance of it. We need a search party in endless trouble. Bother Eustace. Meanwhile, Eustace slept and slept and slept. What woke him was a pain in his arm. The moon was shining in at the mouth of the cave, and the bed of treasure seemed to have grown much more comfortable. In fact, he could hardly feel it at all. He was puzzled by the pain in his arm at first, but presently it occurred to him that the bracelet which he'd shoved up his elbow had become strangely tight. His arm must have swollen while he was asleep. It was his left arm. He moved his right arm in order to feel his left, but stopped before he'd moved it an inch and bit his lip in terror. But just in front of him, and a little on his right, where the moonlight fell clear on the floor of the cave, he saw a hideous shape moving. He knew that shape. It was a dragon's claw. It had moved as he moved his hand, and became still when he stopped moving his hand. Oh, what a fool I've been, thought Eustace. Of course the brute had a mate, and it's lying beside me. For several minutes he did not dare to move a muscle. He saw two thin columns of smoke going up before his eyes, black against the moonlight, just as there had been smoke coming from the other dragon's nose before it died. This was so alarming that he held his breath. The two columns of smoke vanished. When he could hold his breath no longer, he let it out stealthily. Instantly, two jets of smoke appeared again. But even yet, he had no idea of the truth. Presently, he decided that he would edge very cautiously to his left and try to creep out of the cave. Perhaps the creature was asleep, and anyway, it was his only chance. But of course, before he edged to the left, he hooked to the le looked to the left. Oh, horror! There was a dragon's claw on that side too! No one will blame Eustace if at this moment he shed tears. He was surprised at the size of his own tears as he saw them splashing on the treasure in front of him. They also seemed strangely hot, 
Steam went up from them. But there was no good crying. He must try to crawl out from between the two dragons. He began extending his right arm. The dragon's foreleg and claw on his right went through exactly the same motion. Then he thought he would try his left. The dragon limb on that side moved too. Two dragons, one on each side, mimicking whatever he did. His nerve broke and he simply made a bolt for it. There was such a clatter and rasping and clinking of gold and grinding of stones as he rushed out of the cave that he thought they were both following him. He daren't look back. He rushed to the pool. The twisted shape of the dead dragon lying in the moonlight would have been enough to frighten anyone, but now he hardly noticed it. His idea was to get into the water. But just as he reached the edge of the pool, two things happened. First of all, it came over him like a thunderclap that he'd been running on all fours. And why on earth had he been doing that? And secondly, as he bent towards the water, he thought for a second that yet another dragon was staring up at him out of the pool. But in an instant, he realised the truth. That dragon face in the pool was his own reflection. There was no doubt of it. He, it moved as he moved. It opened and shut his mouth as he opened and shut his. He had turned into a dragon while he was asleep. Sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart, he had become a dragon himself. That explained everything. There had been no two dragons beside him in the cave. The claws to right and left had been his own right and left claws. The two columns of smoke had been coming from his own nostrils. As for the pain in his left arm, or what had been his left arm, he could now see what had happened by squinting with his left eye. The bracelet, which had fit very nicely on the upper arm of a boy, was far too small for the thick, stumpy foreleg of a dragon. It had sunk deeply into his scaly flesh, and there was a throbbing bulge on each side of it. He tore at the place of his dragon's teeth, but could not get it off. In spite of the pain, his first feeling was one of relief. There was nothing to be afraid of anymore. He was a terror himself now, and nothing in the world but a knight, and not all of those would dare to attack him. He could get even with Caspian and Edmund now. But the moment he thought this, he realised that he didn't want to. He wanted to be friends. He wanted to get back among humans and talk and laugh and share things. He realised that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race, an appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he had always supposed. He longed for their voices. He would have been grateful for a kind word, even from Reaper Cheap. When he thought of this, the poor dragon that had been used to lifted up its voice and wept. A powerful dragon crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and a sound hardly to be imagined. At last, he decided he would try to find his way back to the shore. He realised now that Caspian would never have sailed away and left him, and he felt sure that somehow or other he would be able to make people understand who he was. He took a long drink and then, I know this sounds shocking, but it isn't if you think it over, he ate nearly all the dead dragon. He was halfway through it before he realised what he was doing, for you see, though his mind was the mind of Eustace, his taste and his digestion were dragonish. And there's nothing like a dragon like so much as well as fresh dragon. That's why you so seldom find more than one dragon in the same country. Then he turned to climb out of the valley. He began the climb with a jump. And as soon as he jumped, he found that he was flying. He'd quite forgotten about his wings and it was a great surprise to him. The first pleasant surprise he'd had for a long time. He rose high up into the air and saw innumerable mountaintops spread out beneath him in the moonlight. He could see the bay like a silver slab and the dawn treader lying at anchor and campfires twinkling in the woods beside the beach. From a great height, he launched himself down towards them in a single glide. Lucy was sleeping very sound, for she'd sat up till the return of the search party in hope of good news about Eustace. It had been led by Caspian and had come back late and weary. Their news was disquieting. They'd found no trace of Eustace but, in, but seen a dead dragon in a valley. They tried to make the best of it and everyone assured everyone else there were not likely to be more dragons about and that one which was dead about three o'clock that afternoon, which was when they had seen it, would hardly have been killing people a few hours before. Unless it ate the little brat and died of him, he'd poison anything, said Rince. But he said this under his breath and no one heard it. But later in the night, Lucy was waked very softly and found the whole company gathered close together and talking in whispers. What is it? said Lucy. 
we must all show great constancy, Caspian was saying. A dragon has just flown over the treetops and lighted on the beach. Yes, I'm afraid it's between us and the ship, and arrows are no use against dragons, and they're not at all afraid of fire. With your majesty's leave, began Reepicheep. No, Reepicheep, said the king very firmly, you are not going to an attempt a single combat with it, and unless you promise to obey me in this matter, I'll have you tied up. We must just keep close watch, and as soon as it is light, go down to the beach and give it battle. I will lead. King Edmund will be on my right and the Lord Drinian on my left. There are no other arrangements to be made. It will be light in a couple of hours. In an hour's time, let a meal be served out and what is left of the wine. Let everything else be done silently. Perhaps it will go away, said Lucy. It will be worse if it does, said Edmund, because then we shan't know where it is. If there's a wasp in the room, I like to be able to see it. The rest of the night was dreadful. And when the meal came, though they knew they ought to eat, many found that they had very poor appetites. An endless hour seemed to pass before the darkness thinned and birds began chirping here and there, and the world got colder and wetter than it had been all night. And Caspian said, Now for it, friends. Then they got up, all with swords drawn, and formed themselves into a solid mass with Lucy in the middle and Reaper Cheap on her shoulder. It was nicer than the waiting about, and everybody felt fonder of everyone else than at ordinary times. A moment later they were marching, grew lighter as they came to the edge of the wood, and there on the sand, like a giant lizard, or a flexible crocodile, or a serpent with legs, huge and horrible and humpy, lay the dragon. But when it saw them, instead of rising up and blowing fire and smoke, the dragon retreated. You could almost say it waddled back into the shallows of the bay. What's its wagging its head like that for, said Edmund. And now it's nodding, said Caspian. And there's something coming from its eyes, said Drinian. Oh, can't you see, said Lucy, it's crying. Those are tears. I shouldn't trust to that, ma'am, said Drinian. That's what crocodiles do to put you off your guard. It wagged its head when you said that, remarked Edmund, just as if it meant no. Look, there it goes again. Do you think it understands what we're saying? asked Lucy. The dragon nodded its head violently. Reepicheep slipped off Lucy's shoulder and stepped to the front. Dragon? came in short voice. Can you understand speech? The dragon nodded. Can you speak? It shook its head. Then, said Reepicheep, it's idle to ask you your business, but if you will swear friendship with us, raise your left foreleg above your head. It did so but clumsily, because that leg was sore and swollen with the golden bracelet. Oh, look, said Lucy, there's something wrong with its leg. The poor thing, that's probably what it was crying about. Perhaps it came to us to be cured like in Androcles and the lion. Be careful, Lucy, said Caspian. It's a very clever dragon, but it may be a liar. Lucy had, however, already run forward, followed by Reepicheep, as fast as his short legs could carry him. And then, of course, the boys and Drinian came too. Show me your poor paw, said Lucy. I might be able to cure it. The dragon that had been Eustace held out its sore leg gladly enough, remembering how Lucy's cordial had cured him of seasickness before he became a dragon. But he was disappointed. The magic fluid reduced the swelling and eased the pain a little, but it could not dissolve the gold. Everyone had now crowded round to watch the treatment, and Caspian suddenly exclaimed, Look! He was staring at the bracelet. <laughs>